Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and the Hoffman Breast Center at Mount Auburn Hospital, I'm so pleased to welcome you to this evening's program, In the Kitchen, Remembering Julia with Your Favorite Chefs. In just a moment, I'll turn you over to Alice Hoffman and Susan Pores, who will be kicking off our program this evening. But first, just a quick note that in just a moment, I'll be posting the harvard.com link to purchase tonight's featured title, In the Kitchen with Your Favorite Chefs, Celebrating Julia Child. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and truly support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. We sincerely appreciate your support. Uh, this evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for any of our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event also has auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. And finally, as you've no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings these last many months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so pleased to introduce Alice Hoffman and Susan Pores, who are going to kick things off for us this evening. Alice Hoffman is the best-selling author of more than 30 works of fiction, including Magic Lessons, Practical Magic, The Rules of Magic, The World That We Knew, The Marriage of Opposites, The Museum of Extraordinary Things, The Dove Keepers, and others. The fourth and final novel in the Practical Magic series, The Book of Magic, will be released next month. And we'll hope, we hope that you'll join us for our virtual book launch with Alice on Wednesday, October 6th. Dr. Susan Pores is the director of the Hoffman Breast Center and chief of breast surgery at Mount Auburn Hospital here in Cambridge, Mass, and an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Pores is also the associate co-director of the Arts and Humanities Initiative at Harvard Medical School. She is dedicated to enriching medical education with the arts and humanities and is the editor of the books, The Soul of a Doctor, The Soul of a Patient, and Cancer, Biography of a Disease, among others. We're so delighted to be hosting this event this evening. Alice, Susan, the digital podium is yours. Hi, thank you so Hi. much. Thank you, Susan. I'm so glad to be here with you. And um, also, I'm so glad to be at Harvard Bookstore, my favorite bookstore. And, you know, Jeff has done so much for the Hoffman Breast Center. We always, we have an event every year, an author's event, and Harvard Bookstore is always the, the store that sells books. And Jeff has been so incredibly generous. And I'm just so impressed with all you do. I just want to preface it by saying, you know, I'm a, a breast cancer survivor. I was, um, I think I was diagnosed in 1998 and I, um, you were my doctor. I feel that you saved my life and as you as you do every day. And uh, I'm just, you know, so floored by all you do and by the care that I got there. And then we decided together that um, Mount Auburn needed to have a breast center and have been working um, ever since. And now there's an incredible breast center there. Maybe you want to just talk a little bit about the center and and what you do over there. Oh, thank you so much, Allison. Thanks to the Harvard Bookstore for giving us this opportunity and all the chefs that are joining us. It's, it's just a terrific event. Um, I always love a chance to talk for a moment about the Breast Center. I'm just so proud of what we've built there. We have an amazing team of doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, every specialty and the, the best of equipment. And most of all, a really caring team of um, individuals that that uh, really take care of every patient like they are the only patient and give everyone really a, a lot of love along with the best of care. I can really attest to that. Every time I meet someone who goes there, they are just just full of love from the care that they've gotten there. And, and then on top of everything else that you do, you have been working with Mary Catherine on this incredible book, which I frankly am giving to all my friends as presents. It's the perfect present um, with all the star power and all the star power that's there with you tonight. Um, it's a great um, 
gift and I, I, bought, I think I bought 10 of them to give away. But also, you know, I remember the night that Julia Child was there at um, to raise money for Mount Auburn. And um, it was an incredible night. She was so generous. And um, there were so many chefs there who gave so much. People were buying her wooden spoons and her aprons. We were auctioning them off. And it was just an incredible night. And I think what you and Mira Catherine have done is quite wonderful and just it has the warm-hearted feeling of the breast center and um just thank you so much for doing this i'm so glad to be able to be here with you tonight and just congratulate you all oh thanks so much alice and i think what we'll do is let mary catherine take over pretty soon because everyone wants to hear from the chefs and i just want to say a few words about mary catherine just like alice um said about her restaurant upstairs on the square being her favorite restaurant. It was my favorite restaurant too. I was heartbroken when it closed. And um, since closing that restaurant, Mary Catherine's gone on to uh, be the director of development for the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. And it's just been a joy to work on this with her. And I haven't really met many of the chefs in person, just uh, a, a few of them, but just to communicate by email the stories they sent, the recipes that they gave. I, I just feel so lucky to have all of that great energy come this way and help the Breast Center. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion. So, Mary Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Sorry. That's what I thought. Thank you so much, Susan. I have to, I have to, um, you know, sort of piggyback on what you said because my mother died of breast cancer, which is why I've always been very. And we've been our restaurants were always close to Mount Auburn Hospital, um, and there's always been a great partnership. But I have to say, because I've had, you know, I'm considered high risk or whatever. I'm there, I'm there like four times, four times a year, and people are so nice there. Everybody is just so delight to you know sort of almost happy to see you and they're just all so sensitive and wonderful and i have to say um that probably comes from the top so congratulations for having a really wonderful um uh group of people that you've inspired there and i appreciate it um so here we are um it, it's kind of fun to uh to think about um, restaurants in the 90s when when Julia was at her height and restaurants now and we're going to talk a little bit about that but in me first I thought I'd really introduce um, and maybe you all want to come in you chefs as I introduce you um, just to give a little bit of a biography about what we're talking about who we're talking about so first I want to just talk about Gordon Hammersley um, which whom everybody knows of course so Gordon is, and his wife Fiona opened Hammersley's Bistro in a tiny storefront, which I remember because I was living in the South End, in Boston's up and coming South End. The restaurant's bistro inspired food and was unique and simple. Remember the wonderful roast chicken. Um, inspired by New England ingredients, was an immediate success and Hammersley's Bistro quickly became one of Boston's favorites. Hammersley's was closed in 2014 um, after a run of 27 years, fantastic. From 2014 to 2016, Gordon wrote a cooking column for the Boston Globe. I really miss it because I loved it when I saw it and a wide array of, of, of recipes. He writes a food column for the magazine Upland Almanac. Um, Kevin Connor, um, and I see you're in Kevin. Uh, Kevin's a good friend of Michaela's and mine. Um, he is now the CEO of Community Servings uh, in terms, um, uh, which is a not-for-profit not food and nutrition program providing services throughout Massachusetts for individuals and families living with critical and chronic, chronic illnesses. Now, all of you, well, many of you might out there might know, but we all know that we've been very um, close to Community Servings because its success depended on restaurants through its last 30 years of business. And, and it first started as an AIDS organization and has gone on to be one of the really foremost um, organizations to feed people with critical illnesses. Um, Kevin's a native of upstate New York. 
he's been a professional chef for 20 years and um, he's just a wonderful person. But prior to joining the staff of community servings, he worked as executive chef for the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. He is motivated by the significant impact that food can have on someone who is sick. And he aims to integrate new recipes and different cuisines into the menu to help ensure that medically tailored, and this is the key point, medically tailored meals are flavorful while still meeting the dietary needs of clients. Um, and he's a graduate of Johnson and Wales. And Lydia, my good friend, Lydia, um, uh, who basically, uh, okay, so she's a James Beard honoree. And of course, as everyone knows, runs Scampo at the Liberty Hotel. She has been such an iconic part of the, of the food world in Boston for so many years, starting when she first lifted the big um, stock pot at Maison Robert and was the first woman in that kitchen, which was like the, the restaurant in Boston, you know, way back when, um, and uh, Maison Robert. And she also was the founder of probably, you know, one of the really groundbreaking restaurants in Boston, which was Biba. And Biba still remains kind of my favorite restaurant. And I've spent a lot of time there in the 90s, as did my longtime partner, Deborah Hughes. Um, she also, um, let me just find myself here. She, um, she also was chef owner at Lockover and Town Stove and Spirits. And so right now she's, I think you're concentrating mostly, Lydia, on, uh, on the Liberty, but on Scampo, but anyway. And finally, Michaela, again, my good friend and colleague, um, and she is one of the early pioneers in the Boston food renaissance of the 80s and 90s. She started with, of course, her groundbreaking Italian restaurant, Michaela's, uh, in East Cambridge. And then, um, and she really launched the career of many, many um, people, including Todd English. Um, geez, I can't even, you know, there's there's so many, Jody Adams, um, and lots of people uh, who are now um, continuing the, the, the legacy there. Um, she is currently operating the Blue at Boca Raton Restaurant, I mean, sorry, Resort, and also serves as co-founder and board member of community servings. Um, and she and I have been involved there for many year, years. And it's been a really uh, wonderful association, restaurants, feeding people, feeding, feeding people who are sick. So um, what I wanted to do first is kind of talk a little bit about Julia. And I thought I'd start by saying that we live just, I mean, our restaurant upstairs in the pudding was, and then upstairs on the square, but mostly upstairs of the pudding, was um, only a few blocks away from Irving Street where she lived. So Julia and I became fast friends because she came early and often to our restaurant, often with Pat and, uh, and Herb Pratt, who I think a lot of people, a lot of you restaurateurs know. And they would make a foursome and they would come in. And what's interesting is we were feeling our way. We weren't, you know, educated in um, culinary institutes or whatever. We just had a passion for food and wanted to do it and thought, let's start a restaurant. And Julia came in and of course we were very cowed. And one of the first things she did is said, turn up the lights. And I think that everybody will recognize that, which is she was used to French restaurants and she liked to see the menu and see the food. And we got to know that whenever Julia came in, we, we, you know, Deborah and I were all into low lighting and twinkle and make people look good. But when Julia came in, we turned up the dimmer. Um, a, a, a host, a longtime host contacted me today and said that she rode up in the elevator. We were on the third floor. It was upstairs at the pudding. And, um, and she said that she got caught in the elevator, which was not unusual, unfortunately, in that old hasty pudding building. And she said that she, she was bringing Julia up and unfortunately the, the elevator sort of, sort of stopped or hiccuped and they had a great conversation. She in fact spoke French and they had a whole French conversation about how if there was only enough butter, it would probably solve the problem. So um, I also have a really wonderful, a friend of, a friend of mine gave me the, um, the, um, rest, the menu 
for the 80th birthday celebration. I think we all remember that. And it's unbelievable when you see it, it's all in French. But I saw that there was a really wonderful um, hors d'oeuvre and um, it was cod cheeks and caviar on crisp potato sheets. Do you remember that, Lydia? And it was you and Susan Regis, who of course was a longtime chef with, with us at upstairs at the pudding and upstairs on the square. So with that, what I wanna say is that's some of our reminiscences of Julia, who was a, who, oh, and one more, which is when she came back from Santa Barbara, where she moved to when she got older and wanted to have a, you know, a little bit of more controlled life. She came back and she invited me and Deborah to breakfast at Pat Pratt's, right at the point when we were between upstairs of the pudding and upstairs on the square. So that was, um, you know, 2000 or so. And she wanted us to bring the business plan, the, um, the uh, um, kind of coda of, of what the restaurant would look like and, our, and, and talk to us for two hours about exactly what this restaurant would be like. And I thought that that was really the most wonderful thing about Julia. Julia was a great gossip. She, every time I gave her a ride back from Boston, which was often from women's chef events, she wanted to know who was, who was there, who was sleeping with whom, not quite that, but also, you know, who was, who was coming up, who was going down. She was, she was a force of nature. And um, I, I know I want to talk, we want to talk about lots of things tonight, but I think we start by talking about Julia. And I thought maybe Gordon, you could, you could, um, you know, start us off and say, what, when did you first meet Julia? And, um, and what was your last meeting with Julia? Um, yeah, interesting. Um, I think the first time I met Julia was in about 1980. And I was working at Ma Maison in Los Angeles. And Julia came in to, um, to have lunch and say hello to Wolfgang. And, um, and we were all introduced to her. And as all of us know who are chefs, Julia would go into a kitchen and, and literally say hello to every single person working in the kitchen and want to know about them and what their background was. So she and I chatted very briefly um, at that point. And then later in the evening, she was there to do a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood. And it became very clear to me about three o'clock in the afternoon, I had just finished cooking lunch um, with the rest of the crew, that it was going to be a disaster. The, the, the bit was is that, and understand this is 1980, the bit was that the women were going to hobnob in the front of the restaurant and um, uh, drink cocktails and smoke cigarettes, and the men were going to help Julia in the kitchen. It became very clear that nothing was getting done. And I, uh, I volunteered to help along with a couple of other people. My job was to, to make braised celery. And, um, uh, and then the, the, next, the, the next night she was gonna do a demonstration for Planned Parenthood somewhere else. And she invited me to, to help her in that too. So it started kind of a, a great friendship there. Fiona and I used to go to Santa Barbara and have lunch with, with her and Paul and Fiona and Paul would talk about whatever they talked about and look at photographs and stuff. And Julie and I would cook uh, lunch in the kitchen. It was lots of fun. Later though, 1983, Fiona and I were headed on our way back to, from France. And I said to Julia via telephone from France, I said, Fiona and I are thinking of moving to San Francisco. And she emphatically said, no. She said, you're coming back to Boston and I want you to meet Lydia Shire because you need to work for her. And I did. There we go. See, that's the thing is that when I, when I was saying how many people work for who, whoever, whomever, it's, it's such a big right. octopus of, of, um, of people who, you know, I don't know who's at the center, but there's many tentacles. Uh, Lydia, why don't you weigh in on this and talk a little bit. I know, I know you love Julia and um, I'd love to hear a little bit more. Well, you know, I always try to describe her as um, almost a humble person. She was more interested in getting people together. You know, she'd open up her home. She would have innumerable events there. 
because she really wanted to see the interaction of person A and B. It wasn't about herself. And I just thought that was really one of the best things about Julia. And yes, she did love gossip. In fact, one night she came to Biba. There were about 10 people there. And at the very end of the night, I went out and when dinner was over and I sat down next to her and she leaned over and she said, so what's the gossip? And I couldn't believe that she said that to me. And, you know, I can't even remember what I said at that point. But I then she looked at me and she said, let's go to Chinatown. We haven't been to Chinatown in a long time. And she loved Chinese food. And um, so we have done that. We've done that. And she would have the duck with taro. She loved that. Um, you do know that um, Julia did not like arugula. She liked watercress, but she hated arugula. And she was very particular about her lamb. She always liked it medium or a point, you know, just to the point where it's a little firm, not um, bloody rare. And I think Julia was really right on the lamb. I even now I find myself, I like lamb that is what we call set, you know, not ghibli rare. What do you think, Gordon? Don't you kind of agree with that? It's kind of. Uh-oh, you're muted. Now I'm back. I was just going to say, when I first came back from France and I was cooking lamb at the Seasons Kitchen, and I sent a lamb out that was super rare because that's what I was used to. And you said, you know what? The Americans will not eat that. And now, today... I cook my lamb just under medium. So I think you were right. She was right. I agree. As usual. Yes. <laughs> um, Michaela, do you, do you want to, do you, I know she loved Michaela's restaurant, Michaela, um, in, you know, East Cambridge. And do you want to talk a little bit about, about Julia and your reference? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I can't, I was late to Julia. With, uh, not with you guys. You met her early, early on in California. We're so old. Yeah, <laughs> but I, um, she, she was, she. I think it was the Morashes who brought her in to Michaela's yeah. uh, for lunch. She said, you know, and she said, I've heard this is a good place, so let's see. She wasn't really, you know, like arugula. She was not inclined to the Italian. She was really so much a francophile you know watercress made sense arugula not so much um uh so but she said oh well well this is good this is this is this is good it was when todd was todd was the chef and we had been open only about eight weeks and todd was barely on his feet he, could, he couldn't even breathe he was so exhausted so he had taken it was a monday and he'd taken the day off and I kept trying to get a hold of him saying, you have to come in. Uh, Julia's here, she's here, she's here for lunch. You gotta come in, you have to say hello. Uh, but he didn't make it uh, for lunch, but, uh, but she immediately after lunch, as Gordon has said, went right into the kitchen and walked from one person to the next. And Zelda, who was the sous chef who was on that day, who was a really talented, talented woman, she said, uh, so what's your history? Tell me, tell me, you know, how did you get here? And, and Zelda said, well, I didn't go to school. And she said, well, so what? Uh, how long have you been cooking? And, and, and uh, Zelda said, well, since I was 15. Oh, so you've been an apprentice. That's why you're so good. Well, that's wonderful. Keep it up. I, I, I hadn't actually experienced anybody who had been, who was so um, positive and, and uh, supportive of, uh, you know, of everybody. Literally, she walked from person to person to person. And so everybody was in heaven, of course. And when she walked into the restaurant, I have to say the entire place went dead silent. And even though there were incredible scientists there and there were really interesting people who were inventing things from uh, who were in East Cambridge, the place just went quiet dead when she walked in the door. Mm. So, and, 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 to, and, to, and to piggyback you, Lydia, she also 
Oh, if she liked what you were doing, if she respected what you were doing, you were on board with everything. She, she called me once. She, 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 she connected you with things that she felt were important to you. And there was a big um, dinner, for, uh, the uh, Ritz was doing these dinners, one after the other of chefs from different hotels around, uh, around Europe. And, and they had the chef from the Cipriani in one night. And so she called me and she said, well, come to dinner. You know, uh, it, it, there's an Italian chef there. So you need to come to this dinner. She would never have invited me to a French dinner or, you know, any other country, but, but to, to, uh, Italian, you like Italian, you're Italian, you come to the Italian dinner. And while we were sitting there, the first course was a sweet and sour uh, fish that, that he was making. I don't remember who the chef was, to be honest with you, but um, I was also seven months pregnant. So the, 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 they, they had a sweet and sour uh, fish that was being served and there was no wine to go with it. It was the only course that didn't have wine with it. And she called the waiter over and she said, where's the wine? And he said, well, there isn't, <laughs> he said, there isn't a wine that goes with this. She said, of course there is. Find one. Find one. How about, how about an Osti? You have one of those? And he came over and poured two glasses of Osti for us. And, and she said, <laughs> cheerio, you know, so, and I thought, oh God, I'm so, I'm so pregnant. Oh, what the hell? <laughs> And uh, <laughs> you couldn't say you couldn't say no. I mean, there was no way to say no. Um, but that she was so welcoming and warm and humble. She really was humble, and I think she encouraged that in everybody uh, around her. Uh, yeah, that's it. It's absolutely true. Thanks, Michaela. Um, I want to I want to bring in Kevin a little bit who wasn't necessarily exactly in the restaurant world, but is very, very connected to the restaurant world in terms of community servings. And all of us have been part of your, of community servings and your um, kind of um, progression over the last years. Um, you know, one of the questions that I kind of put out there for people to realize is how much do you think that restaurants are um, what should I say? Uh, you know, how much does the public know how much restaurants do philanthropically and, and are part of both in the 90s when, when maybe things were a little bit different and we maybe didn't think quite as much about our, um, our duty as feeders of people, but we were starting to think about that, especially as AIDS came in. And then, which is when community serving started. And then it's become, you know, it's really an, uh, an upward um, trajectory in terms of um, what restaurants do in terms of keeping philanthropic um, initiatives going, especially with, with uh, agencies like Community Servings, which has really, with its new building, fed uh, people during the, during the pandemic. So... Kevin, can you comment on that a little bit? Kevin's, Kevin's been, by the way, our good friend and um, uh, the chef and now is basically uh, in charge of, it feels like everything. And, uh, <laughs> and so, um, so we we're, look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really got my start in restaurants in the, in the mid to late nineties. And, you know, it, it was a very competitive and very hardworking, you know, environment. But, you know, what kept me in it was the relationships that I had with the people in those restaurants. And we always found a way to give back. Um, and that's really what, you know, ironically brought me back to, brought me to community servings. And over the last nine years of being part of the, the agency, one of the biggest events we have, which is called Lifesaver, is where restaurants from all over Boston have really given back to our agency and providing a, you know, a table. And some of these tables are worth thousands of dollars. And people make a donation to our agency, have a wonderful opportunity to be a part of the restaurant community, but also our community at Community Servings. 
and that's only grown over time. So from every year, that's it's gone from 50 restaurants to 70 restaurants to over 100 restaurants, giving to our uh, giving to the community, not just to community servings, but being able to um, feed people in these communities that are really in need. And you know, the power of food is so magical. Um, what what I see people being able to do with food, not just the nourishment, but just being able to bring people together. Like hearing all of your stories about Julia, it 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 actually reminds me of how I got introduced to Julia. So just hearing about how humble she she was, and I actually got an opportunity to meet her while I was at Johnson and Wales. She was humble. She was so gracious. She just was so <laughs> welcoming. And my introduction to Julia was through my mother, who really couldn't cook at all. But, you know, growing up in upstate New York, Buffalo, New York, the food scene really was not that great. But in the, in the early 80s, my mom would dress me up. She would take me to Toronto and we would go to the best French restaurant every three or four months. And I was a, a five-year-old eating pickled herring, eating foie gras, and all these great, you know, things. And I would come back home and these kids were like, what are you eating frog legs for? But it was just the excitement of food that my mother introduced to me. But it was really, she was introduced through, through Julia. And I think, you know, as, as I grew up, I started to understand how food really impacted me and the importance of being able to give back through food. And that's what community servings is all about. Um, you know, the agency is 31 years old and we, you know, we serve the whole state. I mean, when you think about preparing meals, we do about, I mean, we serve about 1700, you know, different individuals and families throughout the state. And we're providing them with 10 meals a week. I mean, when you think about that, 17,000 meals each week that we're preparing and they're diet specific, whether you're going through diabetes or you're, you are dealing with cancer or you are dealing with chemotherapy or renal, you know, renal failure, these meals are really diet specific to help you to, to get better. And we, we, we know the power of food and how it really can impact your life. And you saw it with Julia too. Like her humility, her her work through food really helped to change everyone's lives that's on this call right now. Uh, yeah, that, that's hey, Kevin, great, Kevin. I, Absolutely true. I'm sorry, who is going to... Hey, Kevin, can I just... I'm, yes. I'm sorry, I just want to say to Kevin, one of, one of the great joys that I had at Hammersley's Bistro was cooking that lifesaver meal. Mm. It was just really really a great night, uh, incredible amount of enthusiasm uh, for the event. And as you say, it's not about, it wasn't about the food. It was about people coming together around the table, you know, in a common cause. Definitely a, a great event. Great, great idea. And what's, what's really incredible is that the new building, which allowed and with the new kitchen, you know, which, which gave community servings the possibility of cooking for way more people happened exactly it was like February 2020 at which point in March um, you know the pandemic hit and community servings was ready to go to feed feed people in the pandemic so it was fantastic Absolutely. Um, so you know which which is fantastic you know the whole thing is the food community is a very special community um, people ask me all the time do I miss it um, and I don't feel like I, there's anything to miss because, in fact, I'm still part of it. So when I walk through Harvard Square, I see a million people that we married because we did a lot of weddings. And, um, and uh, you know, whether I remember them or not is another thing, but they remind me. And um, the fact that we all are part of a real community. Now, the thing, the thing that was interesting in the 90s, though, um, and 2000s, before the pandemic, was that was really a cool thing to be working in a restaurant and to be a chef in a restaurant. And it was, it, you know, people who might have considered a career in medicine or law thought, okay, I'm going to commit myself and to the culinary world. And by the way, I'm going to put on a chef's hat and I'm going to be 
you know, own a restaurant in five years. Now, some for some people that worked and others it really didn't. On the other hand, I think that that, that since the pandemic that has really changed and um, everybody is finding a very hard time getting people to, um, to staff their restaurants. And I think part of it is that everybody kind of realized with the pandemic, wow, the restaurant world is hard. The restaurant job is hard. Cooking in, cooking in a kitchen is hard. Can anybody comment on this? Because it's been very interesting for me, talking to all my restaurant friends, how it's shifted a little bit. So um, well, uh, I, can, I can mention to you what is definitely very difficult for us now is finding help. Um, I would say that during the pandemic, when we were shut down for you know eight months, um, a lot of our staff, a lot of our cooks, our male cooks went into construction and they make more money at construction than cooking. And uh, I can't tell you how many we've lost to that. Um, we just get by, you know, Simone, my co-chef is amazing at finding people. You know, he's Colombian and he's got his fingers out all the time. But even right now, he is struggling and uh, it's difficult. I think that it was a time, oops, okay, wait a minute. No, you're, you're good, you're good. I am, okay. I think that, I, I, I think that what, what the pandemic did was it allowed people who were working for the sake of making a paycheck rethink their lives to some extent. And they were in the restaurant industry, not because it was a great passion for them, but because it was a really okay way to make money. And it was exciting and interesting. And there were, every night was a little bit different, but it wasn't as though they were, lots of people were not drawn to it because they were, they had to cook. They had to, or they had to be a part of, a, a, of an organization. I think the people who stayed in it are the people who actually really love, love it. But now I think we've depended on people for a very, very long time who, who haven't necessarily loved it and they haven't been making a living wage necessarily. So I, I think we're in a very, very, very difficult time in our industry because we're taken for granted to some extent. That, that we have, uh, we're a bit, we're, you, you asked us, you, one of the questions you asked us to think about was what's different now between, you know, in the restaurant business than, it, than, than during Julia's reign. And I think it actually has to do with business, you know, that it's no longer, it's, it is about business. You know, you drive the numbers at the top, you have to drive the numbers at the bottom. And we, we uh, cannot possibly, charge enough many times i mean you, you can figure you do figure it out but people guests don't want to pay for for what it is that you need to pay in order to make people have a fair living and i do think that's where you have to start you have to start by increasing all the wages and that was not the case when uh, during julia's time you know people were just happy to be in that business to some extent to some extent, uh, uh, but uh, it's a business, and um, and it's more of a business now than it used to be. Which isn't to say that I still believe it's an unbelievably creative business. You know, it, it allows people to dream and 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 to you know listen. I know. I'm sure Lydia. Every time you make a dish, you taste the whole thing before you even make one piece of it. You know, it's all in your, it's, it's in your DNA. It's in your mouth already before you've actually made the plate. You know, uh, uh, that, that's incredible. And, and you, Gordon, I mean, I mean, I'm not, ever, I'm a restaurateur. I'm not the chef. I have been saying that for 30, five years. I am not yeah. the chef. Exactly. But, um, I have a good palate, 
you know, and I understand people to a certain degree. I have been fortunate to work with incredibly talented chefs, uh, Jody, Jody Adams and, and Todd and a, a variety of numbers. All, all these people, they are brilliant. You, you are brilliant because you taste it before you even make it. Mm. But we, we have to charge more. We have, because this is, this is serious work that pe people are doing. And we need people like, you need Simone, you need, you need people who are working with you, who love the food as much as you do, but they need to pay rent. They need to pay, you know, everything. And you, you also asked about family. Are, is it still possible to have a family feeling in a restaurant? I'm a deep believer in that. But I think it means that the leadership, you are, you're the head of the family and you have to make sure that your family is taken care of. Uh, I'm not at the, the, the restaurant the Blue anymore. We closed it, we had to close it during COVID. Um, but I have engaged with the, the chef and the, and the uh, general manager who I worked with for 10 years there and um, I've been working with them for the last year and a half so they could open a restaurant. And they opened a restaurant uh, about two months ago. And uh, the deal was everybody gets paid what they need in order to have a living. Otherwise, don't do it. You have to be able to support the people who are working for your dream. Uh, so I... I uh, I'm a little, you know, I so agree with you, Michaela, and it, it seems like a dream when we think of the restaurants in the 90s and early 2000s. It's very hard to realize that every, that you were responsible for every, you know, for dishwashers, for every line cook to make sure that they make a living wage. Like, for instance, Lydia uh, and Gordon, too, would you open a Biba right now? Would you, would you take that? kind of risk to open a, you know, what, what to me is such an incredible restaurant, Biba um, or Hammersley's. Would you do that in this, in 2021, 20, oh, gone on 22? Would you take that risk? Uh, I mean, I would. If you, well, I if you, if you would. The, yeah, but I gotta say, Lydia, I know you really well. And you like me, you like will take any risk. <laughs> well, no, because people will always have to celebrate. Yes. So there's an end of the day. There's a five o'clock somewhere and you need to go out. You need to be served and waited on. And that's what we love to do. Gordon. Yeah. Right? I, yeah, no, I, Gordon. I, yeah. I agree with that a hundred percent. I agree with that a hundred percent. But here's where here's where. Fiona and I have always thought a little bit differently. And that is that, that the business actually comes first. The business drives the food. The business drives the real estate deal that you make. The, and, and so witness the fact that we went into the South End, a place that was not considered the greatest upscale restaurant um, place when we got there in 1986. And, um, and we paid $7 a square foot for that space. <laughs> and could we have Can gone to Boylston Street? Wow. Could we have gone to Boylston Street? No, we couldn't afford it. And so, and so we made the business decision to open in the South End. Now the South End transformed itself into something completely different, but, but nevertheless, I still, I still, I agree a hundred percent that people are going to want to celebrate. They're going to want to drink. They're going to want to laugh. They're going to want to cry. We do all of that as restaurateurs and as chefs, and we want to cook the best food we can, but we also need to be able to afford to put it on the plate. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's, there's an you know, I think what a lot of people don't understand about the restaurant business, and it was laid bare by the pandemic, laid bare, raw yeah. bare, is that is yeah. that the business is a brutal business. And that if you don't know what you're doing and you don't understand the numbers, then you're gonna fail. 
Right. I yeah, agree passion, with that. passion for food is not is not a reason to open a restaurant. Um, at that point, no. give dinner parties. Right. If you are if you have a business sense and a passion for food, then you then you ought to think about it. Now I have one last question because we want to go to go to um, questions in a minute. I'm sure there are very many, but I know that uh, now that I'm hearing that Michaela, you you're not um, actively at Blue anymore, though you are so busy. But all all four of us and Kevin is working really hard <laughs> every day. So you're you're out of this conversation. But the four of us have left. Well, actually, and Lydia is working full time too. But um, people ask me. Yeah, I opened the restaurant in August. <laughs> you did? Okay, then then, yeah, then maybe I shouldn't these, ask this question. With these kids with these, ask, with these kids like, in I didn't realize that. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's the people you were talking about. So every people ask me literally every single day, "Do you miss the restaurant business?" And I say, "No," because of all the stresses and you know long hours and whatever. What I do miss a little bit is the adrenaline and. And there's every there's every so once in a while on a Saturday night in the fall in Harvard Square, and I think, wow, you know, it used to be so great to be coming into the restaurant and know it was a big Saturday night. But I, because of social media, I stay connected a lot with, you know, and really I walk through Harvard Square and I see everybody I know, and that's what's great about the fact that Harvard Square is a village. But the question is, Gordon, um, and you know, I would say Gordon because really you're. You're like me, the only person who's truly retired. What do you think? And I'm sure you get the same question I do, right? What do you think? Are you are you happy? You yeah, I do. You? All, all yeah. the time. All the yeah. time. Am every, I happy day, I'm right? retired? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I and you're happy you're retired. Lucky stars that I have not had to, had to deal with the pandemic yeah. on the one hand. Um, and, and there are certain things about the restaurant business that we all know. We all know that are um, objectionable to have to deal with on a daily basis. And that said, there are things about the restaurant business that I miss desperately, terribly. And most of it has got to do with the team dynamic of creating a dish and watching that dish go to a table and being enjoyed by a group of people. That I miss terribly. But I can, I can do that here because I cook for Fiona and she's the best audience in the world. And God knows she is like, you know, put it this way. If I put something in front of Fiona and it's not up to standard, she's like my worst nightmare customer. <laughs> and, and at that point, if she starts to complain, I just ask her whether or not she's parked with us tonight. And I hope that she gets in the car and goes down the road for another drink. <laughs> You know, seriously I, though, you know, seriously things, though, no, don't, I'm, I'm glad I'm retired, but yes, I miss the restaurant business sometimes. Yeah, and, and Arguing what with I my miss sometimes is that feeling of getting your staff together. We did so many weddings at the restaurant and getting them all together and saying, starting always with the same, the same uh, comment, which is, okay, everybody pay attention. This is the most important day of these people's lives. And here are these people, there's you know, Joe Schmo, and he's this, and there's um, Mary, you know, Connolly, and she's this, and here's what's going to happen. And that I miss, that whole sense of teamwork, and it's true. What I don't miss, of course, is things breaking all the time, always. And I remember, um, Michaela, you said, oh my God, thank God I'm at the Charles when you opened Rialto, because you said, finally, there's a team to actually fix things so engineers anyway. I love the engineers I love oh them. my god it's so true <laughs> now at this point, we never I, okay go ahead go we ahead. never had no we never had that and and let me say that oh. one of my favorite nights and of 27 years of being in the restaurant was a saturday night when the place is absolutely jammed. The waiters, for some reason, were doing what they were supposed to do. The cooks were doing what they were supposed to do. I looked around, and it was great. And suddenly, sewage started coming out of the drain <laughs> hole oh. in under yeah. the sink in the corner yeah. of the kitchen. Yeah. And, and God love him, Dan Noonan grabbed a snake and started snaking down there. And I went, holy mackerel. 
welcome to the restaurant business. And actually, Guess what? actually that, that, we that, laughed that, about it. And right. it is that, what it is. You know? To some degree, Lydia what the restaurant one, business Lydia is. Lydia sent me out one night. Lydia sent me out one night to find rosemary in the middle of service because we had to put rosemary on some lamb dish. And I actually cut a piece of um, pine <laughs> off, the, off the front of the, of the hotel's um, landscaping and, and gave it to her and she said, perfect. I okay, remember so that. that kind of stuff you know. Yeah. Don't you remember? I remember yeah. that. I remember it was, that. It was close. Way up like, do we go back or what? <laughs> That's fantastic. And believe me, we all have those stories, which is, and it always seems to involve sewage somehow, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were in a 120 year old building. So right. my God, anyway, let me open um, everything to questions. And now I'm going to look at the chat and see what, um, if there might be any questions that people have. So if you do have questions, please post them in the chat. I don't see any right now, but um, if anybody, maybe I'm not doing it right. I yeah, just look at the um, the Q and A button rather than the chat. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. Q and A. Looks like we have um, a good number. There we go. Okay, great. Q and A. Okay. Um, so an anonymous atten attendee says, "Are there any local up and coming young chefs that you admire? Who do you think Julia might have admired?" That's a great question. And why don't we start with? Um, with you, Michaela. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm, th I'm in Algonquin. So, oh, okay. Well, what do I think? I think actually that, uh, I think she would have roamed all over the city and I think she would have loved what, you know, she would have loved the expansion of Formaggio and uh, the various people who are behind the scenes there. Um, I think that she, she, I, I, I I don't know, you know, I think she would do what she'd d done before and gone into the kitchens and met the mm. young chefs. And now, and now um, Lydia, you're, you're, you know, right there in the kitchen. Um, have you met anybody right now that is just a, a wunderkind? In, well, in I mean, I think we should consider, we like should, that. we should consider Mike, Michael Scalfo. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, Mike yeah. Scalfo. So, yeah. I mean, I, don't, right I, don't, I know. And I don't know if um, he knew Julia back then. He may have been just coming up. But I think his food is amazing. So do I. I love yeah. going to his restaurants and I think um, he's great. Um, I have a pastry chef right now who is hysterical. He has he dyes his hair red like mine. We even compare, you know, our fake <laughs> red hair colors, you know, but he's doing amazing desserts. And I know he did not know Julia. I mean, I would love to introduce him to her. She would have been just so super with him. But there are a lot, you know. Will Gilson. Will Gilson. Yep. Yeah, Will Gilson is Will fantastic. Will Gilson. Um, and, and he yeah. does great, beautiful food, but he, and he also does a tribute to tri a, a dinner once a year as a tribute to Julia. So I don't know if he ever, right. he does a now, tribute and- uh, yeah. um, Douglas Williams is all, Douglas, yeah, is I getting it right? That's true. Yeah. 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 I think he's fantastic I, and he's, has so done, do I. yeah. So do I. I think, I yeah. think that Doug Williams right now is is at the top of his game. Of his he's game. very, very yeah. good. He makes beautiful, beautiful pasta dishes, that guy. Yeah. I mean, I was there one night and just was totally blown away by what was going on. And Julia, I think, would have loved that restaurant. She yeah, would have loved the scene up there and yep. the, the simplicity of it and the humbleness of that of that space. I think she would have really liked it. Yeah. And let's face it, in the restaurant world that we were in in the 90s and 2000s and some of you are still in, was a very white world. So it's really wonderful to see people of color coming into that scene and being successful. And um, I know that, that um, you know, there's a lot of incentives right now, but, but um, there are great uh, restaurants right now in, the, in Dorchester in the South End that are getting support and that are opening and that are you know, really wonderful. Um, and I'm trying to think of the one I'm, you know, right now that is, I won't think of it, but I'll come back with it. But anyway, Barry Russell, who is a good friend and, and at 
um, was in the development department at Mount Auburn says, I think Julia would have wanted all of her employees to earn a living wage. We all agree with that. Um, that said, how do we inject philanthropy into the equation? Would, diff would diners donate if there were an option at the bottom of their check? Tough one. What do you think, everybody? Um, let's let's start. Actually, let's let's uh, bring Kevin in a little bit and think. You know, you you go out, Kevin. What do you think? Would you be willing to do an extra um, ten percent? Restaurants have been so, so generous to community servings, but is there a way for diners to um, to show their interest in philanthropy? I I absolutely think so. I think what the pandemic has done is really. Uh, really giving us the opportunity to really appreciate what the restaurants have always done for us, um, giving us a place to be able to dine and celebrate and not have to think about washing a dish and just enjoying yourself. The restaurants really have always provided that. And I think this is a time where the public should be giving back to, to those cooks, to those dishwashers and to the restaurant community. I think it's a great opportunity to just give back. Um, I myself, just being in the industry for so long, I, not only would I tip the waiter, but I would tip the kitchen. I think it's just important that we find ways to give back to everyone that works in the restaurants. And that's that's what keeps them there. That's, that's what really shows your appreciation for what they do. And whenever they ever had the opportunity, like when I was working in restaurants, I would always find time to give back to give back to a uh, city mission or Pine Street or wherever I could, because I've seen the importance of it. it, it it's hard work, it is. You know, I, I worked at Number Nine Park and worked at Radius and they were in, in wonderful restaurants. And like, I have a sewage story from Radius as well at the, at the, at the most busiest time, but it were, they were glorious times of my life of just working and just everyone you know, with a, with a great mission to serve. But yeah. right now, I think it's really important that we look at restaurants and show our appreciation for what they do. Really, truly do. I think we have one more time for one more question. And I love it from my friend, Susan Farr, who says, because I think we all have to weigh in on this. What dishes did you serve Julia that she really adored? And I have to say one thing, which is um, Julia came from the very earliest days when we were tiny little restaurant open five days a week as upstairs of the pudding um, Tuesday through Friday and she would come and um, and Michael Silver, Deborah's husband was the chef. And what she really adored is um, a bacchio. And a bacchio, if, as many of you know, but not everybody, was um, very, very young veal. Um, and, and it was served in two different ways, a beautiful little navarant of, of you know the of some of the meat of the lamb, and then tiny, tiny little um, little chops. And it actually, um, abacchio, um, it very politically incorrect. In the old days in Italy, it was taken from an unborn lamb. Um, and so, but in the, but actually, in, in its true sense, abacchio was fantastic, and Julia really appreciated it. So, Lydia, what what was her favorite dish for you? Oops. Oh, did I, I just un, un, unmute Lydia. Okay, sorry, yes. Um, every time she came in my restaurant, she ordered duck. That was it, yeah. she had okay. duck. Yeah. Um, there you go. Yeah. Okay, Michaela. Jody's duck. With oh, that's so funny. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, slow she roast didn't have that that much. Slow and roast Gordon, duck with green olive. Gordon, I'm, yeah. Gordon, I'm sure it's the chicken, right? Uh, often, often the chicken. Um, but I got to just tell a funny story about um, we were serving uh, red grouse that I had gotten from Scotland. Um, wow. One uh, menu came in and she had and she wanted the red grouse and she was sitting in the corner with Herb and Pat Pratt and. Um, and the waiter had to tell her very clearly that this is a wild uh, bird. It's been shot with a shotgun, so you may find some pellets in it. She said, no problem. <laughs> she was given the dish. There was a, a guy who sat down next to her, table of two, right next to it. And he looked over and was thrilled that Julia was there. 
And, um, and he said, well, I'll have what she's having. And the waiter said, well, you know, just to let you know about the, the buck, uh, bird shot maybe in there. And she, she's just bring, just bring it, just, just like hers. So he bit into the first bite and sure enough, the guy, you know, was shocked, shocked that there was bird shot in his um, first mouthful and he spit like two pellets out. And he turned to Julia and said, did you see that? And she said, just eat it, you ninny. <laughs> oh, I love that. That is so great. And the, the thing that. is, but hopefully he didn't sue you, Gordon, because that, that would have been the, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like he split he was, his tooth or whatever. So, well, I really thank everyone for being here tonight. I think it was really fun. It was so fantastic to see my old friends, um, all four of you. Um, and um, the one thing that we can bring out of tonight is that we all need to keep celebrating, keep eating, and keep supporting restaurants, and that restaurants need to keep supporting philanthropy because, you know, let's face it, we all, you know, restaurants are, are, are about feeding people, and it's not just the people who can afford to pay, but it's also, you know, supporting some of the, some of the agencies that, um, that do such good work like community serving. So, um, so I take it back to Harvard Bookstore and you probably want to wrap up, right? Indeed, yes. Uh, thank you all so much. This was really pretty wonderful. Um, and it, uh, I don't know, I gotta say, it made me a little emotional just thinking about food and restaurants um, during these times when, you know, everything is complicated and and, uh, and things are things are changing quickly. Um, but it was just really wonderful to hear you all speak. Can I leave you with one last thought? Of course. One time, I think that all of my cohorts in the restaurant industry remember Chen de Rotisserie dinners. Oh. And <laughs> some, some of these uh, wine dinners that were very pretentious and don't quote me. Oh God, the meeting. Anyway, at one point, there was a really wonderful dinner and we did a special menu and our graphic designer, Melanie, did a beautiful job with all the little stars. It was at Christmas. And Julia insisted on like, coming in the kitchen and doing that whole thing where she was gonna take the saber, in this case, oh. a kitchen knife, and you know, cut off the top of a champagne. <laughs> she had a few glasses of wine, uh, cut off the champagne top, which is a very French tradition and whatever and whatever. And so this was toward the end of the dinner and the whole staff of, obviously was in the kitchen as we all have all said, she loved to come in the kitchen. And so we set her all up and we kind of were like this. But you know what? She pulled it off. She took this kitchen knife and she went, <sighs> and she the the top popped off, the the champagne you know, um, flowed over, and she started pouring it for our staff. So that is a really nice way to end when we when we salute, say salut to uh, Julia Child and to all of us who have had such great careers in the restaurant industry. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining yeah. us. Thanks, Mary Catherine. And buy the buy the book, by the way. Yes, um, please. We have dropped the link in the chat uh, a few times, or you can just go to harvard.com and type in our search bar in the kitchen with your favorite chefs and it will pop right up. Um, again, thank you all for being here and a huge thank you to everyone who joined us this evening on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Keep reading, keep eating, take care and stay well. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.